Today I'm going to be talking to Nick Selby, who's an information and physical con security consultant, a cybercrime investigator, and a police detective. He is the co-author of Cyber Survival Manual from Identity Theft to the Digital Apocalypse and Everything in Between, which was published in 2020 and 2017. Uh, in Context, Understanding Police Killings of Unarmed Civilians, which was published in 2016. Black Hat Anomics, an inside look at the economics of cybercrime, 2012. He was also technical editor of Investigating Internet Crimes in 2013. Uh, he is the host and or co-host of several podcasts, or has been over the years, including Tech Net Burndown, Trail of Bits podcast, and the Quality Policing podcast. He's written articles for the New York Times, Washington Post, Dallas Morning News, USA Today, LA Times, and others. Uh, I'm happy to bring you Nick Selby. Uh, I'm here with Nick Selby. Uh, thanks for agreeing to do this, Nick. Yeah, really excited to do it. I, I first ran into Nick while he was a podcast host, and I've followed him on various social media platforms, maybe five years or so. Uh, but I hadn't really spoken with him in real life until recently. Uh, this style of video is different than the ones that are usually on this channel. It won't be for everybody, but I think most folks will find it interesting anyway. And during the podcast, with any luck, we'll discuss uh, cybercrime investigation, law enforcement, IT systems, police violence, the role of police as first responders to situations involving people with mental health problems, the dynamics of the interaction between police and citizens, and Nick's outlook on newer tech like facial recognition and AI. Sound good? <laughs> Sounds good to me. So how did you get into information security? Uh, I was actually working in the world of physical security, and I was in Russia in the very early 90s. And um, it was it, it was the Wild West. It was just really crazy. Um, there was not a single day that I was there when somebody didn't do something that made me say, like, what? And, you know, it was <laughs> it was just so crazy. And, and one of the things that I remember um, I was going they, they they had all these markets when you, you bought stuff that people would just like bring and sell stuff. And there were software markets and they were um, it wasn't legal, illegal. That, that really didn't come into play, but they were all selling bootlegged software and they would sell it at that time for a dollar a disc. So, and it was a CD ROM. So like if you, if you wanted to buy uh, Microsoft windows, you know, I think that was like three discs. So that, that was like, you know, I think $3 or something like that, you know, you, and, and I, I started talking to people and I started looking at the, the the way they were getting around all of the the anti piracy stuff the way they were getting around um, international uh, attempts to to stop this you know every every now and then you'd see on the news uh, you know the 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 software alliance would get a get a big pile of these things and run them over with a bulldozer and I started realizing don't copy that, that floppy yeah <laughs> and and I realized that both sides of the of the information security uh, space was were innovative and really interesting and that's that's sort of what got me into it and then i think around 1995 when i was just so fed up with windows that i started learning linux um, i started i started you know getting involved in in open source software and i and it just sort of grew from there yeah i was, I was gonna say you you actually wrote an article in 2002 called the year of the linux desktop oh <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit of a meme now, but I get the sense that you're a pretty big fan of open source software. I, I I am a big fan of it. Um, I I was a big fan then. I don't think I pitched that story. I think that that story was pitched by the tech editor of the of the International Herald Tribune, because it was um there was a big deal that year. I think the Scottish National Police replaced Microsoft. It was not Nottingham. Sorry. Nottingham. Nottingham? Uh, no, I, no, I thought mm -hmm. it was Scotland, but it might have been. You're right. I mean, like it, it happened. Also, also Malta did, but like. Um, I just remember talking to this guy with an absolutely uh, impenetrable Scottish accent. Um, <laughs> but it was that they, they got rid of it and they, they went to Star Office or Open Office, whatever it was called back then. And I, so, so I got commissioned to do this piece on, hey, Linux is really taking off. You should do something. <laughs> yeah, I actually remember that. I was, I was well into open source at the time. And I, I actually started using Linux around the same time you did. Oh, cool. Um, eventually... Um, you came to land a role uh, in New York City as kind of a, a muckety-muck uh, security person. <laughs> um, 
in I guess that's <laughs> not the most technical way to describe it. But, um, but you were you had outsized influence uh, in that department, and you have some pretty interesting stories about how you got that job. Can you can you share that? So you're you're talking about the NYPD. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I didn't yeah. Mention. Yes, the police. <laughs> All right. So my my. <laughs> My my NYPD job started. It actually started in 2011. Um, I was I was working, I was working in tech in Texas, uh, actually doing incident response. I was a, a reserve police officer, then investigating cyber crimes and uh, and doing what is a what is a reserve police officer? Reserve is a volunteer. It was a <clears throat> like in in Texas, you go to the same police academy, you carry a gun, you get get a police car, you go out and do stuff, um, but you're not being paid and. Uh, I was doing that uh, kind of as I had gotten really unhappy with uh, finding law enforcement during incidents. Like, why is it so hard to, to call a cop when you're fighting an incident? Um, and so I went to the police academy to, to try to get an answer. I still don't really have the answer. Um, but I, I started writing with a, a sergeant friend of mine, something called Police Led Intelligence. It was a blog. And, and one day in 2011, I get this phone call on my cell phone. And it's this guy, he's like, hey, I am the commanding officer of the counter-terror, what was it, the counter-terror, or the cyber counter-terror unit in the intelligence division of the New York City Police Department. I was like, all right, cool. And he said, yeah, I don't know what I'm doing. And I'm like, well, I, you know, I, I don't believe that. He said, no, 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 seriously, I'm a detective. They put me here because they were like, don't worry about, don't worry about computers. We got a building full of geeks. Don't worry about languages. We, we got a building full of, of language. We just want to know how they can hurt us. And we want you to, uh, you know, be a cop thinking about cyber. And I'm like, that's, that's actually really a really smart way to do it. So we started talking and I ended up meeting him. I ended up doing you know, just talking to him a lot and helping him with um, d different different initiatives that he was trying to to put together. Mainly, it was around training. Like, how do we how do we do what we're trying to do and learn how people want to hurt us in in the cyber realm? Not necessarily, you know, hurting us by hacking. They they were actually worried about people blowing up New York, but they wanted to know about online recruiting. They wanted to know about things like that. And so, over the years, we became really good friends. And uh, in 2015 or so, uh, he and some other people at the NYPD, they asked me if I would help put together their their uh, counterterror and cyber uh, investigations con uh, conference. And, you know, of course I will. <laughs> that was really great. And they told me then that they were creating a job of the director of cyber intelligence and investigations. And would I like to apply? And so I, I did, they were like, you know, this'll, this'll be great. You can come and work here. And I applied for it. I was one of like 94 people and, and only 535 days later, uh, they hired me. It was like most, mostly background checks. <laughs> Quick. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, by the time I got there, most of the people who had thought of the job and who had, uh, conceived of it, they, they were gone. Um, and so, so people didn't quite know what to do that there was, there was the, the intelligence analyst side, they, they knew what to do, but, but on the, on the law enforcement side, they didn't really know what to do with me. They were kind of trying to, trying to figure out, you know, I had a lot of conversations like I'm not your IT guy. Was it, what, do, do you think it gave you a little more freedom to make your own job? 100% because, because nobody knew what to do with me. Um, and you know, cops, and I say this as a former cop, both a volunteer and paid cop, I, <laughs> Cops are the kings of don't tell me how to do my job. So you get some some guy who comes in and tell, starts to tell them how to do their job. He's not he's not like welcomed with open arms. Um, there, there were there were people there who were very, very happy to have me there. But a lot of people just really I, I'd have conversations with people and I would see their I would see the, the wheels in their brain turning around like, where did this guy sit in my command chain? And do I have to listen to what he's saying? <laughs> <laughs> right. um, but yeah, I, I there was an early conversation, and uh, John Miller, the the deputy commissioner for uh, intelligence and, and uh, counterterror, and uh, Chief John Hart, Chief Tom Galati, and uh, Jim O'Neill, the the, the uh, commissioner, that w I was bringing up cyber crimes. There was a story I think that day about you know how all these people were getting scammed with Bitcoin ATMs. Like they were they were being told that their con ed was going to get cut off unless they paid you know a thousand dollars into a Bitcoin ATM, and and I just said you know it's really interesting because we think of these things and we think of them as crimes against old people. We think that like old unsophisticated people 
are going to get victimized by this. But the fact of the matter is, we don't know anything. You know, I've been here for a few months now and I, I'm looking around. We don't know how many of these things happen. We don't know the 10 most common scams. We don't know the average amount of money that people get scammed for when they get hit. We don't know the even the most basic demography. We don't know how old the people are. We don't know their gender. We don't know their race. We don't know where in the five boroughs they live. We don't know anything. And we're the NYPD, the people who count everything. That's really bad. And O'Neill was like, yeah, that's really bad. Do something about it. So that that sort of gave me the entree to to start looking into that. And that's I spent a, a good year and a half working on that project. So it sort of seems like a one, one thread through your career has been that um, you're very data oriented. I love data. I absolutely love data. It's funny. I was thinking before we started talking, um, because we're we're going to talk about the the book on police killings, and we don't we don't have to get there now. But I, I just want to tell you why I started working on that project. Um, uh, when I when I first got out of the police academy, um, I took a look at uh, Texas law, and um, I you know they put you on they put you when you first get out they put you in field training, and so you you just sit there doing night shifts and just driving around stopping cars, talking to people, just getting into stuff and writing tickets and stuff, and you know. And then they let you go on your own. So months into this, I'm doing it. And I decided one day, you know, I had stopped probably a hundred cars by that time. And I'm like, let me run the, the state of Texas. Um, the, the state of Texas has a formula to determine whether I'm racially profiling. Let me just run that formula. And so I ran it and I discovered that I was a racist. Uh, <laughs> and, you know... You didn't even know it. I, I, did, I had no idea, but I discovered it because mm-hmm. Texas said so. And, and, you know, so I'm looking I'm looking at the way this is and I'm trying to figure it out because basically I'm working in this town and it is a um, this town is like a, a wholly incorporated city within the city of Arlington, Texas. And there's one five lane road that goes north south through this town and it connects neighborhoods in Arlington at the north to neighborhoods in Arlington at the south. And. Um, I know that I'm doing all my stuff at night. And by this time, I'm like 45 years old. So I'm old and my eyes aren't even that good. You know, I got glasses and stuff. But I'm driving north and I'm running radar on south going cars. And I'm looking for people who are going 11 over the speed limit of 40. So, you know, they would be going at least 51 and I'm going 40 north, which means that I'm closing on them at 91 miles an hour at night. And I'm trying to to pick out of these five lanes or three lanes of of opposing traffic. (laughs) Which is the car that's speeding? I almost never saw the driver of the car. I'm just looking at the cars. I'm looking at the radar. So I'm like, I I don't think that I'm, you know, I was like, well, maybe this is unconscious bias. Maybe this is something I'm just like, what is it? And then I realized when I'm looking at the data, I'm like, this data is just bad. It's wrong. Because the way they do it is they say, take my town, the demography of my town, which was only about 8% black, this little city in 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 uh, Arlington. But it, but it's got a bunch of other people rolling through it. Well, that's the thing. It, I was comparing all the people I stopped on the road to the people who lived in the town, but that's clearly wrong because there's only 6,000 people who live in my city and there's 100,000 people in Arlington and everybody who's driving through the city is coming from the north from Arlington and going to the south from Ar- So they're all coming from something. I should be comparing I should be comparing this data not not to my town, but to where the drivers are coming from. And that took me, I don't know, it was like six months of data science playing around and getting help. And we finally came up with a weighted formula that took, you know, for every every ticket we wrote and every warning we gave, let's take the zip code where that person is from and make a weighted demography of the whole constellation of different towns from where they're coming. And now we can compare to the tickets that I'm writing and now we can see. And that, Are you still a racist after that? I'm sorry? Were you still a racist after that? No, no, I wasn't. And, um, you know, it's funny because when you do it right, the people who are behaving badly, they pop out immediately. It's really amazing. If you do it wrong, everybody just looks like a racist. (laughs) And that's really not helpful. But when you do it right, you know, the two people who... And because I did this, we, I ended up doing this for, for departments all over Texas. Um, and, and it was just, it happened the same way every time. There's always like one or two people. And the data, 
the data helps you reduce the problem of cops are racist to those two cops seem to be doing something that is wrong, but I don't know, let's talk to them. And sometimes it comes out that, yeah, they're racist and they need to be fired or get training. But often it also comes out that these are guys who work in the middle of the night and they're looking for drug cars. They're looking for, they're, they're doing actually what you want cops to do in the middle of the night is look for bad guys who are, you know, carrying stuff that they shouldn't be carrying. But you'd never know unless you saw the data that popped out, okay, some of these things are not like the others. A couple questions. So uh, getting that weighted thing together and sort of and sort of making that the law of the land, was there a big pl political fight involved in that? No, not at all. Um, actually, every every police administrator. OK, there, there was a little bit of pushback later from some some of the, the police administrators in larger agencies. And I'll tell you why in a sec. But um, in, in all the smaller agencies, they were actually really. Um, they were really interested in the, the conversation. They were really interested in the data and they, they wanted to, to, you know, to, to get this data. It's interesting. The, the way police, you asked about, you said we were going to talk about police IT systems, police IT, IT systems are, are truly backwards. They're very um, sort of server, you know, nineties based kind of, you know, Novell netware. Yeah, the, <laughs> netware. And, and also just like, you know, there's a lot of cobalt. There's a lot of non-relational proprietary flat file databases. But there's also this this weird um, thing that happens in municipal software, which is that um, the, the vendors, a vendor in a law enforcement agency, the average incumbency was back about 10 years ago when I was looking at this, about 17 years. Um, you, you need to, the, the pain of using the software has to overcome the pain of changing to a new software. And, and because budgets are tight that, that, you know, you're, you got it working again. So a lot of these software companies didn't want to change things and they certainly didn't want to integrate with anything because that, that could threaten their, their, you know, position. And so what I found was that, for example, when a cop pulls somebody over and they, and they, when they pull somebody over. They call into dispatch and the dispatcher uses the computer aided dispatch system and that and it talks like, OK, so officer officer Jones was at the corner of Maine and first at three o'clock in the morning, stopping ABC one, two, three, you know, this car that gets stored in the police, the, the computer aided dispatch system. If I write him a ticket, that ticket gets stored in the court record database. And if I do a search you know, either probable cause or consent search. It, it's a, it's sort of up in the air where that data will live. Like the fact that there was a search could be in the computer aided dispatch, but the fruits of any search could be in a totally different database. And there's usually no references between one and the other. So it's, it's to, to a chief, to get somebody saying, Hey, I know how to go into all your different systems, bring the data into one place and then look at it. That's actually interesting to them. The pushback that I got from chiefs was around the kind of more than I want to know question. It wasn't that they didn't personally want to know. It's that once they knew it would create a, an affirmative responsibility to do something about it. And since they didn't know what they were going to find, they were very nervous since it wasn't required by law that they have this records, these records, they were nervous that this would create something that would cost the city a lot of money and not really get them any value. Yeah. Well, it sort of sounds like just the threat of, of the system might have a beneficial impact. <laughs> well, I mean, not, not immediately, of course. You know, I'm just saying, like, the chiefs knowing that something like this could be done means that they may be a little more proactive about pulling out people that they know are, you know, not, not, they're, they're doing their best, you know. Sorry, no, I, um, I don't actually think so. I, I've never heard that reaction. Um, the, the reaction that I always heard, and, and so I, I consulted with police departments in, I mean, I'll, I would say seven or eight different states, um, big cities, small towns, things like that. I, I never um, I never really got a cop saying that they didn't want to know. I, I got cops worried that it would create administrative problems that they wouldn't be able to handle. Um, but like even when I when when I was working with with the city council and some people and the police department in, in Ferguson uh, after the Michael Brown shooting, I, I don't I, I never heard anybody say that they didn't want to know. 
Um, and, and to the contrary, like th- there's a, there's a real perception of, um, there's a lot of misperceptions of law enforcement uh, procedures and sort of everybody knows no, no cops ever do anything, you know, that they know all the bad cops. I don't believe that that's true because I think that, I think that look when there's, when there's idiots and there's, and there's racists. uh, Yeah. We often know Um, I've, I've made complaints about one. I've actually testified against an officer um, and like, and nobody, nobody blacklisted me for, (laughs) for doing that. And quite the contrary. But um, I think that a lot of times, um, there are gray, there's areas of gray because policing is, is really, it's a, it's a different kind of field that there's a lot of, um, cops have a lot of discretion and they're, they're often working alone. And sometimes cops will do things that are, you know, in, in hindsight, really bad. And they, they actually might've gotten into it in good intentions. And then the problem happens when they, when they start to explain it, they realize that they're getting into some kind of jackpot and then they lie. That's that, then we get, then it gets really bad. But I've never, I've really never run into personally any, uh, kind of cover-ups or, uh, I, no, 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 la, 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 I don't want to hear that. It's, it's often been more, much more pragmatic concerns. Yeah, so I, I think you already, I, I was going to ask you another question, but I think you already answered it by, through the way of that, but I was going to say, when, when the folks got the data, and, and hopefully there was some promise of additional resources after, you know, that, you know by implementing the system, you know you're going to have to, you're gonna have to do some, some stuff afterwards. And hopefully that came along with it. But the question was going to be, um, you know, was it always that when some when when those two people popped up, was it always like, yep, yep, I I know, yep, I knew that from the start, <laughs> but, or was it or was it often a surprise? No, I think it's, it's I think it's often a surprise um, because I think that you're assuming that the two people who pop up are the known knuckleheads, and and I I think that what happens is. So, so if you take a look at any, any group of, you know, let's take a, a sort of a, a modest size agency of a hundred cops. Um, and you know, day shift is like 15 guys and two of them are those, those guys on motorcycles with those sunglasses who, who just write tickets. They're, they're like already riding the ticket when they get off their bike, walking towards you. Uh, the ones you Watch. don't want to be pulled over. Right. So if, if you start looking at contacts with the public it's you know, outside big cities where, where there's foot patrols, um, most contacts happen either through 911 calls or, or car stops. Um, and so if you start looking at the contacts with the public and, and hopefully you get agencies that are smart enough to do, you know, written warnings if they don't give you a ticket, uh, because you always want to have a record. And it's really great if, if you've got a guy who's making 20 stops a day, but he only writes three tickets, then you've only got three records of who he stopped and what and, and who he talked to. So if you if you have him write a written warning, now there's a record and now you can look in. Uh, by the way, something interesting that happens in progressive states versus sort of more conservative states, which is really counterintuitive and surprising. Um, for example, in New York, um, I wrote I wrote an article uh, back in like 2016 doing a, a, a racial analysis of traffic stops. And we, we can talk about that in a sec because it was fascinating to me what what we discovered. Um, well, actually, I'll, I'll tell you, we, we, we discovered when we took a look at a town that uh, black women were were getting uh, twice the number of tickets as as white women drivers. Um, and I think Hispanics were, were getting a little bit less than than the, the, the black drivers, but but more than the whites and the, the, the fines that they would get um, were, were substantially higher. And on its face, that just sounds like racist policing. And when we when we dug into it, we took a look at all the different drivers and, and we took a look at all of the the zip codes that each of the drivers came from. So we, we made that um, that weighted demography so that we could say, all right, are they stopping people out of, uh, you know, are, are they stopping disproportionately more than you would expect? And the answer was no. Uh, it was actually really solidly good. Um, and then we looked at where the traffic stops were being made and they were all in school zones and on this one big road that led to a major employer. It was a, a naval base. And, and so that naval base had this huge number of low paying jobs. And so people were coming from around the Dallas Fort Worth area to go and work at this naval base and they were getting stopped on the road leading to it. 
And so we're like, okay, well, in the school zone, it makes sense because people often get stopped in school zones. And to this one, you know, these are often people who are working two jobs. They don't have a lot of time and they're, they're late to work and they're driving and they'll, they'll speed to go into that place. And that's where they get pulled over. And so we took a look at like, what is the primary cause for people getting stopped in this town? And it was, you know, far and away speed wasn't equipment violations. It wasn't warrants. They weren't being stopped for, you know, too much smoke coming out of it. It was, it was just speed. And that they're was consistent. Sorry. Yeah. They were late to work. And then, so, so we, we kept on looking at it and we're like, why? So why are these, why are the, the people of color getting more tickets? Why, sorry. Why are the people of color getting more fines, the higher fines? And what we found is that when, when white people got a, a second ticket, they get pulled over for speed. So the first, the first ticket's for speed. And then they get a second ticket. Overwhelmingly, the reason for the second ticket was an equipment violation. That's often a broken headlight, a broken taillight. They're, they're missing something that they need. And in Texas, you can get that waived in 10 days if you bring in and show that you, you know, that you got it fixed. And even so, the, the fine is like 50 bucks. That was the number one for, for, for white drivers, male and female, for black and Hispanic drivers, male and female, the number one second ticket was no driver's license. And now it so starts it's, it's mostly about poverty. It's not, it's not about, that's exactly where we came out. It's here. So now you think about this. These are people driving quickly to get to low paying jobs. When they're driving quickly to get to low paying jobs, they don't have the money to get tickets. And when they're driving quickly to low paying jobs, they probably have a ticket someplace else. And when they have a ticket someplace else and they don't pay it because they can't because they're poor, then their it license gets suspended. It and is expensive to be poor. It is they, expensive to be poor. It is very expensive to be poor. And the, the, we, we, we've got some demographics. You can probably link to this, to this article. We, we've got some demographics about, you know, um, f financial, the, the, the financial state. Uh, earnings of people uh, of color in Texas versus people who are white in Texas. And it's, it's astounding. So it was really clear. Now here's, here's the thing, Texas, you know, <laughs> Texas often takes one stop too far on the crazy train for a number of different legislative things, but I could do the analysis because race is listed in the department of motor vehicles record under the driver's license of the person in progressive States like New York. It is not. So I can't do that analysis in New York. Even if I had all the traffic stop data and all of the licenses, I couldn't tell you. And that's just, that drives me crazy. That's just, that's a self-inflicted uh, wound. And, and it means that we can't investigate what's really happening. I think all too often, and, and by the way, the, the, the process I just described to you to, to reach the conclusions that we reached, this was months of work and you know, people don't listen to policing stuff for months. They really just want to know the answer. And the answer is usually the cops bad. And it's often much more complicated than that. Yeah. Uh, out of curiosity, what, what were some, what were some ameliorations that were suggested for, from that? Well, it, <laughs> it gets really hard because any, any ways to fix it, um, you know, on their face could, could themselves be racist. Um, you know, don't write black people tickets. Um, <laughs> or because we, we, we looked at, we looked at it and we did see that, that more often than not people of color, because they made less money and they were more likely to be caught in this, um, were more likely that when you write a ticket that it would go to warrant because they didn't pay. Um, and so what we suggested that, that the state of Texas do is that they take a look at their suspended driver's license, the, the rules for suspending driver's licenses. Um, and they, I don't believe that they have, but it's, it's really onerous. Um, I wrote a, a piece in the, the, the Fort Worth star telegram, I think back in 2014, uh, about the debtors prisons in, in Texas. I mean, like, you know, you, when you owe, when you get a speeding ticket and you don't pay for it, the cost of the ticket doubles. And if you get stopped, you are, you get arrested. And if you get arrested and you can't pay, you stay in jail and they'll, they'll give, you know, if you've got $800 worth of fines, you can stay in jail for four to five days. That's purely debtor's prison. That is unconstitutional. And it's disgusting. Uh, Kendall Taggart at Buzzfeed news did a fantastic story about this all over Texas. She, she found these debtors prisons all over Texas. 
uh, uh, this is fascinating. I, I wanted to uh, move on just a little bit, because yeah. otherwise we're going to be here for, for <laughs> six hours. So, um, You did some retail fraud cybercrime investigations during your time in, at NYPD. Well, Can you describe those generally? Or? Well, sure. Well, so at NYPD, I didn't really do retail. It wasn't really retail fraud. What we were doing was... Uh, I, I did retail fraud in, in down in Texas at Midlothian PD. Oh, sorry. Um, no, no, that was fine. I mean, and that was actually really cool. I went when I got the job there. I went to the chief and I was like, "Look, um, I've done some I've done some analysis and I've got, gone and talked and and you know it is now not profitable to sell diabetes testing strips in this town, in this city of twenty six thousand people, um, because uh, the organized retail gangs are stealing." those you know and tide pods and you know certain certain kinds of makeup and pampers and like th th there's a whole bunch of categories of things that are just being hit by organized retail crime gangs and it is literally entirely at the goodwill of cvs and walgreens that they are selling these things because they're unprofitable and and if they stop then somebody who lives in this town who is who is elderly and diabetic and maybe on a fixed income they're going to have to drive 30 minutes north to get to the nearest town where they can buy these things and so we should really be working hard to work with businesses and reduce um or at least at least increase awareness of our organized retail crime so i, I started doing doing stuff there and, and that was actually really interesting in in new york um that that conversation i told you about uh about the uh, cybercrime. What we were looking at was not cybercrime related to, you know, corporate intrusions or ransomware or anything kind of traditionally the realm of the FBI. We were looking at stuff that was that was not being investigated by anybody because it, it went under the radar. It didn't it didn't rise to the level of, you know, but really. And, th and that was that was where you created you, you created an app in that. I situation. did. Yeah. And and so we we started mining inside the. Uh, the NYPD has a data lake that's it's just absolutely extraordinary, um, and you know they get millions of 911 calls a year. They get it's it's it, it's everything is done on such a big scale in New York. So when we started looking for it, you know how do you how do you go through um, data a data lake that has never tried to identify cybercrime other than identity theft? And so it, it took a few months of, of work and we finally figured out keywords that we could search for. You know, some of them were really obvious, like gift card, uh, ATM or Bitcoin ATM, things like that. Um, there were, there were, it ended up with a list of about 25 keywords that we would search for and get the candidates. And then we would manually go through them and then recategorize and uh, re recategorize and then also um, re rework the, the, the search terms. Um, and we, you know, after a few months working with some crime analysts and working with the the, the comp stat people, the, the the people who do all the statistics, we we came up with a number that was pretty uh, good. We we assumed that one in five people who suffered a cyber crime like this, a, a, a fraud, and what I'm talking about now are like you know the, these calls that that happen. And and I, I would say that anybody who's listening to this has somebody. This has either happened to them or they know somebody this has happened to. Um, they get a call from the police and they say, your, your son has been arrested. He has hit a pregnant woman with his car. Uh, she may die. Um, you've got to pay bail. Uh, you've got to pay for the tow of her car, you know. Um, and the way you send it is either uh, you go down into CVS and buy gift cards, you know, Apple gift cards, <laughs> or you go to a Bitcoin ATM or you mail it in cash to quote his lawyer um, using UPS and they'll explain to you how to do that. Like take a magazine and interleaf the, the notes into there. And you have to do, uh, first, you know, the highest priority UPS delivery, and then we'll get that. And then we'll let your son out. Those, those kinds of scams. Um, th there's, a, there's a whole range of what those are, but you know, it's that, it's that kind of low level scam. And we found out that there were, I think it was $300 million dollars if we did it really conservatively, that's how much it was costing New Yorkers. And the average was like four grand. Now, four grand might not be enough to get the FBI involved, but that's really a lot of money to, to a lot of people. Yeah, to a person. Yeah. And so um, we we realized that the reason that these weren't being investigated was that the, the cops had never been trained. The patrol officers had never been trained. So when somebody calls and says, Hey, I, I've got I've gotten defrauded. Somebody called me and they they stole my money. They made me buy gift cards. 
as soon as the cop hears the word cyber, they're like, oh, yeah, you got to call the FBI. They, they, we, we don't do this. Uh, thanks a lot, FBI, for, for saying that you are the premier agency handling cybercrime in America, giving every cop in America the ability to say, whoop, that's it, 10-8, I'm, I'm out of here. Um, but uh, if we can train these cops to ask the right questions and write down the information, write down the answers in their report instead of closing the report at, the, at literally at patrol, which is what was happening, then the detectives have a chance of actually looking at this. And as a matter of fact, the crime analysts have a chance of putting together a pattern. And while we were doing this pilot that I'm describing, uh, we actually found a few patterns and we actually made some arrests uh, of, and it turned out to be street gangs in New York. Uh, can I, can I ask a really stupid question? Yeah. Um, so people report these cyber crimes to, they, they call 911 or whatever and, somebody comes out and takes a reporter or yeah. they do it over the phone or whatever. Um, and you say that that information that they gather, uh, detectives can look at it. What is the difference between a detective and an officer? Oh, wow. What a great question. So, so the officers are like the, the patrol officer, police officer, like the first, they're the first line. They're the, they're the guys in the uniforms. They're the guys out there on the streets, uh, handling calls or, or stopping you for, you know, various observed infractions and having uh so they're they're sort of the first line um law enforcement they're the they're the police presence they're the you know the people who are supposed to um uh, see things as they are happening or be the neighborhood police officer to to give a give a presence that dissuades people from committing crime in front of them etc when when a crime happens and the patrol officer writes a report that said that something happened and it isn't solved right immediately. So, you know, you have a traffic accident and the two drivers are, are like yelling at each other and one of them pushes the other one and the, the police come and maybe they'll arrest one or maybe they'll give both tickets and then the guys get in their cars, they drive away. That's done. That's, that's solved. That's been resolved. But sometimes it's like, you know, somebody stole my car. Uh, somebody stole my whatever. So, you know, uh, I, I lost something or somebody damaged my property. So now the, the police officer, the patrol officer, is going to write a report, and that is going to go to the investigative division. And the d investigative divisions are, that's detectives. As a matter of fact, in, in Texas, uh, as often as not, like my title wasn't detective, it was investigator. Um, but that's the same thing, right? So a detective is actually taking the information that is gathered from the patrol officer and looking to actually solve the crime. So they're, if it's a financial crime, they're, they're going to be looking at uh, developing a, enough, of, enough probable cause to, for example, um, write subpoenas or search warrants to get data of financial records and building a case, talking to witnesses, talking to, uh, talking to people who, who might be able to give more information. Um, and, you know, that, that's what detectives' job is. And so it's, it's really taking it from that initial contact with police to an investigative, hopefully an investigative conclusion. And unfortunately, as, you know, with cyber crimes, uh, especially in, well, in New York, but it's everywhere, it's, it's most often um, all investigative avenues exhausted. They just, they run into a brick wall. Right. And so, but you, you also mentioned, um, uh, oh, uh, Another, another. It sounded like some, someone that you had contracted to to analyze this data as well, not just detectives, but. Uh, oh, there's crime analysts. Crime analysts, there we go. right? And that, yeah, that's not a contract. Those are actually those are people, typically civilian employees, but often there's there's you know sworn crime analysts as well, um, and you know their job is to to. So, for example, you've probably heard of CompStat, which is the sort of late yep. '90s um, statistics program that was. Uh, that was created in the in the NYPD, and um, those are those are uniformed those, those are uniformed officers that are using the the data to inform um, provisioning and and sort of assigning police to, sort of to various more, places. More str strategic things. Yeah. Um, and but there but but crime analysts are also looking at looking at if there's if there's a, a bunch of burglaries uh it's it's usually the detectives and and crime detectives will work with crime analysts to um examine whether there is a pattern and take a look at it so for example there's there's like 
you know, articulation of crime data, like a crime map. Here's a map with pins in it showing the location of all the different places that are involved in this burglary, right? Um, there's analysis, which is, well, you know, here are the time windows uh, for each of these. And, you know, that, that, that could also just be articulation, just like showing it and, and giving you a way to look at it. But could it also be like, hey, you know what? Um, if I take a look at those times, what we're seeing is that those times line up with whatever. Um, that, that would be an analytical conclusion, you know, or like some sort of inferential conclusion that they, that they can draw. And they, they could use that in an attempt to, for example, catch this group by, you know, putting out somebody to do something. And, like, you know, there's there's a lot of ways that the um, crime analysis and uh, detectives uh, investigators can work together to to go after solving a, a crime or a series of crimes. I got gotcha. you. One interesting thing, one thing I thought was interesting about about the app that you wrote is that you told me there's no data entry. It, it's it was just kind of a checklist. Yeah. So, and let me be clear. I didn't write it. My, <laughs> I designed it. Yeah. Uh, my friend Raven Zachary uh, wrote it. Um, it was very, very simple. Just an HTML5 app. And um, all, it, all it did was it imagined the, it, it was data driven. And we said, okay, what are the situations that we've found taking a look back at the last two years of people who've called the police about a cyber fraud a, or a cyber enabled fraud? And um, we found that there were a number of different patterns that we could identify and narrow down to a certain category by asking four questions. And th that was like, how were you contacted? Right. Was this on your mobile phone? Was this on your landline? Was this an email? Was this a website that you went to? Uh, did you did did uh, did you not get contact? Right. Did, did some were you first contacted, um, you know, in another way, like in person? Um, so that that's one. Um, what were you told to do, right? Were you told to give the money? Were you asked for, were you, were you extorted? Did they tell you that, you know, we've got your video showing your sex acts and we're going to, to put it out unless you give us money? Um, or was it that you were told that something terrible was happening, like you hadn't paid your Con Ed bill, so your electric would be caught, cut off, uh, or your son was in jail, or whatever those, whatever those things are? Were you told to pay? And if you were told to pay, the next question is, how were you told to pay? Was it, did you have to go buy a gift card? Did you have to mail cash? Did you have to make a bank transfer, like a wire transfer? Um, and, did, and all these things help 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 both detectives and the the crime analysts figure out where to slot this stuff, and hopefully have some patterns, some some similarities. Yes, as well as just giving you a place to start. So, you know, if we find that somebody got a cell phone call, and the guy said, "Yeah, with the, with the U.S. Marshal's office, your kids in your kids in jail in El Paso, and you you know you've got to pay." bond and you know you gotta you have to go down to your to your bank and and send us a wire transfer uh to to give us the money okay so now we we've got several things right so it was on it was on the phone so now a de any detective can be like okay all right where did that phone come from now almost certainly this is a spoofed voip call right like it's not going to be a real number but if you're investigating something you don't you don't just ignore it. So maybe we want to go after some phone records because we know approximately we can even the, the detective can look at their phone. They can see the number that it said it was coming from and the time and date. So now we can go to the phone company and we can write them a subpoena and say, tell us who was calling this on this time and date. Um, the second uh, thing is like they were told to, to do a wire transfer. OK, what was that bank account? So now we can go down to your bank. We can get the information about where the wire transfer was sent. And now we can write a subpoena to the receiving bank and we can say who owns that account. It's like, really, this is not rocket science. This is like really basic financial investigating. But none of that can happen unless the cop on patrol has asked the questions. Yeah. So that's how, why we need to how ask. Did you, how did you get the cops to know about it? I mean, yeah. That seems like the hardest problem. So we went, um, we went in, uh, there's a, and there's a, <laughs> there's a, an NPR story about this and you can, if you link I, to it. Like, yeah, I've listened to it. Yeah, there's. We went to every roll call for every precinct in Southern Queens because this is a pilot program. Um, so there was like I think it was like seven or eight precincts and there's, you know, three shifts a day. And so we would we would go to every single one of these. And in each one of these, it looks just like Hill Street Blues or, you know, any cop show you've ever seen a roll call. And they're getting the assignments. They're getting told things. And then, and then 
we would stand up and, and I got this guy named Louie, who was a patrol officer. Louie was fantastic. I wanted a cop who had absolutely no cyber experience whatsoever. I wanted a patrol guy because patrol guys listen to patrol guys. And Louie worked in Queens in, in, in one of the precincts in Queens. And uh, he was absolutely perfect. So I got Louie to describe the problem. And it was like a five minute presentation. And he would stand up and he's like, hey, guys, you know, I'm I'm a patrol officer, too. And this is what I do. And here's I've been learning about these crimes. Here's the kinds of crimes that we're talking about. Here's the kinds of crimes that we're not talking about. And here's what we're telling you to do about. And every time he would do that, we would see these cops. It'd always be like a few of them who were just zoning out. And there'd be a few of them in the room. They're like, that happened to my mother. That happened to my aunt. That happened to my sister. That happened to me. Somebody called me and tried to get money from me. Right. And then I would introduce the app and I would do a demonstration of the app like on a big screen in right in the roll call room. And I would show them because here's the this was the, the thing that we had going for us. Every single New York City police officer has an iPhone. So they already had the tool in their pocket to be able to use this app. So the app had to be simple. All you have to do is select the answers, the, like the, the answers to those questions, like how were they contacted? What were they told to do? How were they told to pay? And, you know, were they given further instructions? I think that was like the four. And then they would put those in and all it would do is spit out a list of questions to ask the victim. And all we said to them was write it down in your report. Yeah. And then they knew all about that. <laughs> they knew all about that. <laughs> the, way I, the way I first encountered you uh, you co-hosted the uh, Quality Policing Podcast with yeah. Peter Moskus. Yep. Peter is author of Cop in the Hood, and he was a Baltimore cop. Yep. And I think he's still a professor Professor John Jay College. He is. He's a, yeah, he's oh, a he? criminal justice professor. Gotcha. And uh, Peter still occasionally makes episodes of the podcast, but the format where it's just you and him talking every couple weeks is, is no longer. And I, I love this podcast while you're on it. Thank you. I love, I love your chemis chemistry with Peter. It was often hilarious, <laughs> and and I, I know you know I'll never, I know it's it's not a cards, but I'll I'll probably never stop trying to get you and Peter to do that again. But, well, I mean, we uh, still talk and everything like that. It's just we 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 don't have the time. And and I got to tell you, I got I got really depressed by, I got really depressed because we were we were often f coming to the same conclusions, and yeah, we we always had we had different. I'm, I tend to be a little bit more conservative than him. He tends to be a little bit more. Um, you know, completely anti-gun. I tend to be a little bit, you know, we're not we're not like diametrically opposed, but but we're we had enough differences to make it interesting. But we generally speaking see the world in the same way, and both of us absolutely love data. Yeah, and I mean, you said you got depressed. I got depressed because, um, especially around, I spent I spent a good three years working. Um, with a lot of people, um, taking a look, you know, I took, I took the, the events of 2015 really seriously, uh, which was the year of Michael Brown. It was the year of, there was a lot, there were a lot of, um, a lot of attention to police use of deadly force in that year. And, um, I, I started doing a lot of work researching to try to, to get to the bottom of, you know, how, how much of this is, is actually good policing. How much of this is, um, good use of force, uh, that, that society actually, if they were to look at this would, would, you know, or if a reasonable person was to put into the, into this position that they would do the same thing. And how much of this was, you know, the sort of the, the narrative of the aviator mirrored sunglass wearing racist white cop going around shooting black people in the hood, like, you know, <laughs> and, and it, and so we, I mean, I, I got together with the best people in the world at this from all really all over the world. And, and I gathered a group that was, um, you know, across the political spectrum. Uh, we, the only, the, my, my, I still regret we weren't able to actually get anybody from black lives matter, but, but we got a lot of people who were very sympathetic to that. And we were very, very not sympathetic to cops, uh, and, and other people who were sort of on the government side or across the spectrum. And, and we looked at this and we printed some, um, I believe very meaningful and, certainly well well cited research that was well received and it didn't matter Th like, this is with this is with street cred it was with street cred but it was also the 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 street cred police killings uh database um which is still available open source you can download it i can i can send you the link to that but like people yeah. um and i did a lot of if you go back in like 2015 16 
I was on Fox and CNN all the time. I was writing for, for things. I, I wrote something for the New York Times. Like, I was doing a lot of talking about this. I did my level best to get good information out there and listen and, and um, give informed, sourced data. And nobody gave a crap. <laughs> it was really, it was really difficult. I actually had a Democrat. I was on, I was, I was in Capitol Hill. I was in, um, I was actually talking to a Democratic senator and one of his aides said to me, why don't you just, why don't you just do the same thing that the Guardian is doing? I'm like, first of all, the Guardian's from the UK. Secondly, they're completely subjective and that, that data is wrong. Um, you know, do you, do you want me to agree with them because you th- it makes you sad if I don't agree? Like, that's terrible. I couldn't believe that people who knew better really were okay with accepting less than the data we needed to address, I believe, one of America's biggest problems. We had a, we had a tremendous opportunity to do something. I think we blew it. So yeah, I was depressed. Yeah, I, I, I was going to talk about this a little bit later, but I, I get the sense that there's like real resistance to actual data about this problem. <laughs> about, I mean, yeah, uh, and and some of that resistance just is not ignorance. It's it's planned and it keeps people afraid yeah you know that, 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 that's my that's my take on it I, uh, yeah yeah I mean my my basic and I, I've said this in interviews before so I'm not going to be committing any acts of, of like originality right now but like <laughs> um, there are there are people who need to be in jail there's people who need to be in prison there is evil in the world um, this 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 uh, fugitive in in Pennsylvania over the past couple of weeks. Um, this guy's a stone cold killer. That dude went into some guy's house and switched on his light and the other, the other, oh, no, it went into some dude's house. The dude woke up. He's upstairs. He, he flips the light switch upstairs. The dude downstairs, it controls the same light switch, turns it off. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. This is Whoa. like a scary dude. And, um, and he was out on the road. He was out on the run for, for like what? Two weeks. Because uh, it's hard to catch somebody who doesn't want to get caught, <laughs> and um, and who's you know determined to to stay at liberty. But but the fact is, there are bad people who really need to be locked up, and there are there are people who actually are in the process of of committing harm. They're killing somebody. They're raping somebody. They're they're in the process of of using deadly force or or force sufficient to to commit you know grievous bodily injury serious bodily injury and and those people need to be stopped in their tracks and and there's these are this, this is why police are empowered with this awesome responsibility of of having being able to carry and use deadly physical force um and so you you can't just sort of say you know let's not police that's just moronic um and, and no amount of um violence interrupters is going to stop those people. Um, I believe, I believe in America we're over-policed. I believe that, um, there's, there's tremendous cultural, um, reasons why police tend to, to use force more than they do in other places in the world. Um, but there's also some, um, uses of force that are wholly inappropriate and criminal and, that was actually why Peter and I got together because we, we agreed so strongly about this, that, you know, that quality policing was, was knowing the difference between these things. So, um, the example I gave before was like this guy, Abdulaziz, who was shooting up a, um, a a military recruiting center and he just kept on shooting. And the guys in the military recruiting center, they're not armed. And he killed several people before he was actually shot by police. That guy needed to be shot. And the community, you know, you don't hear anybody complaining. And then there's Walter Scott, who was just flat out assassinated and murdered by somebody who had absolutely no right, not only had no right to do this, I've never met a reasonable person, I've never met a reasonable police officer who thinks that, who thinks that that officer was not a murderer. Um, and then he fucking lied about it, right? And then, he, then he tried to dump the taser on the guy and say that, that like, it was just, so I want to find out, the, I, I want to understand how many Walter Scotts are there and how many Abdul Aziz's are there. How many, that, that was, I think the, the the main question that I wanted answered, and I think that that's just too nuanced for a lot of people to, you know, it's, you have to hold two ideas simultaneously in your head, and that that hurts. 
Well, maybe we can, maybe we can, uh, uh, sort of hinting at it here, but you know, so the data reporting about police related deaths is pretty shoddy in itself. I mean, there, there, we, you know, there's Washington Post data, fatal encounters database, other various sources, but we have numbers for the last, I don't know, eight years or something about the number of people who die in the U.S. as a result of police encounter. Not we, really. We know, like, okay. Uh, what are we missing? So if you take a look, um, so, and, and you mentioned fatal encounters and I think it's a good, it's a good place to start. Um, fatal encounters, uh, is a database that was created by a guy named Brian Burkhart, who similarly has now stormed off in a huff and he's retired in Mexico. And I, I think it's really awesome, but he was one day, uh, you know, he was a, a real, real reporter and he was like looking at, uh, use of deadly force in Florida and he decided, and he found that the previous year, according to all of the official records, there had been no, uh, police use of deadly force in the state of Florida. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, that's not possible. I mean, <laughs> this is, this is literally not possible. And so he started digging into it and he started uncovering the, this is like, I think this is in two. Where was this like 2002? It was early. And, and so he started to try to collect this as a journalistic project. And around 2014, 2015, when, when the guardian and the, and uh, the Washington post started getting involved, they were using the fatal encounters database as the starting point, uh, more so with the guardian, which just literally took it then, which was fine. You know, Brian was okay with that. And, uh, he also, Brian was very gracious with me. He was very gracious with, um, what, uh, um, Sam, Sam's database, like, uh, po- there, there's one that's sort of really, uh, it's very tied to Black Lives Matter, very tied to, like, killedbypolice.net. There you go, killed by police. And Brian is like, listen, anybody who wants to use this data, you're, you're more than welcome to use the data. He really, very, very democratic about it and really just a, a great guy. He really just wants the data out there. Um, so The Guardian came out, and, and my, my beef with The Guardian was that they, they were so desperate to editorialize about the the number of killings that they would just they, they even broke their own rules about what categorize what what was categorized. So, for example, they would list a lot of um, uh, deaths, you know, from a police car having an accident, like a police car would hit somebody else and, and, and somebody would die and, and they, they'd call that a police killing. Um, they would they they would include um, people who died in jails and prisons. That's not police. That's corrections. That's a, it's, it's totally different. Um, they would, they would do, uh, they would list killings by off duty police officers drunk at a bar with their friend who, you know, and then they got into a fist fight and then the cop killed somebody. That's not a police shooting. That's an asshole shooting, right? Like th- these are, <laughs> <laughs> it, th- and they wrote their own criteria and then they would break their own criteria. But, um, the Washington post data is really much better and much more disciplined. Unfortunately, it's only concentrating on shootings. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And in, in my research, I found that about, fi- what was it? About 56% of the people who die after a police encounter died because of a gunshot. It is much, much, much more common to die after a police encounter. Uh, for example, if you are on drugs and you are naked running down the street and fighting the cops and fighting and fighting and fighting, and then you get tased and then you're fighting and fighting and then you get put into handcuffs or you get tear gassed or pepper sprayed and thrown into the back of a police car and then you have a heart attack and you die. That's really, really common. Um, so the, the Washington Post data does show police shootings, but it really that's, that's just a bit more than half of what's important. And I think that that's a, a again, that's a, just a self-inflicted uh, this is the kind of thing that happens when you don't understand the data set that you're going into and you decide that everybody who dies with police is dying because of shooting. But well, let's, let's just, for, for people who don't know, and I think most people don't, all right, uh, I think you could, you could be forgiven for positing, uh, although the data isn't perfect, uh, that over the last few years or so, sort of like clockwork, between a thousand and twelve hundred people die with in encounters with police. Is that about right? Well, that, that those are people. That's people who get shot. Um, that's people who get shot. Yeah, and that's okay. It's about fifteen hundred. Gotcha. It's, it's about okay. it's about fifteen hundred people every year die after some kind of an encounter with police. And and this but so this isn't the number of unarmed people, and it's no. not the number of unarmed black people, nope. and it's not the number of. Uh, 
unjustifiably murdered unarmed black people. This is every, the entire United States for a year. Yeah. 1,500 people, something like that. Yeah. And, and just to, to contextualize this number and, and we'll get into like <laughs> whether we should be looking at this as the problem area in a second, but, um, it's, it's, it's hard to know. Remember I said that there were, I think it's about 11 or 12 million 911 calls in the city of New York every year. Mm. Um, there are, depending on who you listen to, but you know, this is, this is probably a really good range. It's, it's too wide and I wish it was more specific, but this is about right. Because remember, so America has 18,000 police agencies. This often stuns people, especially people in Europe where there's like national police departments and things like that. But there are about 18,000 police departments in America. There's about 12, 12 and a half thousand local police departments in America. And about 85% of them have 25 or fewer officers. That is a massively heterogeneous environment. Cops ain't cops, right? A cop in a small town in upstate New York is, is going to be, there's going to be a lot of similarities, but there's also going to be a lot of differences between a cop in, in, you know, Portland, Oregon or, or rural Maine or Arkansas. Um, the local police are, the policing is local. And, and there's a reason for that. And there's, there's a reason that the Department of Justice, which, which you know, manages sort of uh, justice in America, d- does not tell these, these agencies what to do unless the agencies have gotten in trouble. And then they get into the world of consent decree, which is a topic I won't even touch on. But like they, they really don't. There are no national standards um, of sort of policing operations. There are national standards based on Supreme Court rulings uh, about the use of deadly force, um, the use of uh, certain, you know, the, the, the way police can interrogate, the way police can stop, and, and the things that are constitutional and national in nature. But, but when it comes down to it, if there is a local, you know, if there's a, a local regulation that says that you need to get a permit for, for going door-to-door selling and, and you... Uh, don't get a permit and a cop stops you and asks you to see your permit because you've got your sample case with you, that is a completely legitimate police stop that might not look like it to somebody who isn't from that town, but policing is local. Yeah. So imagine the data and all these different policies that are related to that. It's just, and now now imagine trying to gather the data. There are very few national requirements on gathering data. Even the police, the, the, the database right now that that's supposed to be for use of force federally is voluntary. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, it it, it is just, it is a daunt daunting thing to even consider trying to do, but but, it's even more daunting if you don't think about it. Like if you just, if you just say, well, well, somebody should do something like that's That's going to be really (laughs) daunting, you know? But I mean, you did so, but you did do something. So, so in 2016, you co-authored book named in context, understanding police killings of unarmed civilians, which by the way, every studied cop I talked about hated that title. It, they thought that it implied that I was saying that the police were guilty for killing people. No, they, they, for, they killed for, them. Murdering. Yeah. I didn't say murdering. I said killing. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I know. It's not a good look either way, really. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, well, but, and, but it's, it's the truth. It's the truth. Yeah. Right? And so, so th- that year, you remember that year, it was really, it was really bad. And there were a lot of high profile cases, not just Michael Brown and Walter Scott, but there were, there were a lot of cases. And, and so it, it comes down to, you know, I'm, I'm, how do I look at this? If, if I, you know, I'm a police officer, so I know, I know how to do, I know how a lot of these things happen. And here's what I know. If you point a gun at a cop, you're going to get shot. Uh, some people actually do that on purpose to commit suicide, but like, I'm not really interested in somebody who's pointing a gun at a cop or pointing a gun at somebody else. If you're threatening deadly physical force, it is okay to use deadly physical force to stop you from using that deadly physical force. That's just the law. That's just the way that is. And you might disagree with that theoretically until somebody's pointing a gun at your kid and then you want me to shoot him. You probably do like, you know, people, people, Definitely. this is very, this is very situational. By the way, I've never shot anybody. Um, how, how, how many times have you had to unholster your weapon? Um, really not that often. Um, I, I'm going to say that there, there, there are times that you do it sort of prophylactically. Um, but it was never, you know, it was holding a gun. One thing that cops are good at is unholstering their gun and not doing anything. Um, 
there's a difference between unholstering your gun and pointing it at somebody because once you introduce that gun into a into a conflict situation it's really hard to put it away if if it's like if that's the thing that's stopping the you know it it, and so you really want to be very judicious with the way you you take that gun out you really want to try everything else which is by the way one of the findings in our book was that there's a new generation of cops who are really um a, a lot of cops who are younger now and going back to 2016, so like 10 years ago, getting out of the police, they, they were sort of a, a common comment that I heard was, you know, I'm not paid to fight. Actually, yes, you are. Um, you, That's you exactly, really are. You, you, have, you have a monopoly on force. But, <laughs> the, but exactly you are paid job. to fight, like, because sometimes somebody just needs, somebody just needs to be grabbed, and if they're going to hit you, then you should wrestle them to the ground and put a handcuff on, put handcuffs on them. You know, you, just because somebody hits you, if, if you are afraid to be hit in the face, because you think that that's going to hurt you, then you shouldn't be having a gun and being a police officer. Like you should be able to fight and understand the, the, what used to be called the use of force continuum, right? Like if somebody's going to, if somebody's going to, 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 you know, slap me, I'm going to punch them. Somebody's going to you know, like, you, you sort of gradually go up, but the gun comes, that's the last, that's the last thing you want to do. There's a lot of tools that you have. Um, and, and so we did find that a lot of, a lot of people, a lot of the younger cops were reaching for tools like tasers and, and pepper spray much faster than older cops who were, who were used to going what they call hands-on. Um, and when you think about hands-on, it, it's really interesting. Two groups that are associated, and it, it's counterintuitive, associated with, with lower actually use of deadly force is, is military veterans and, and older cops who've been on, the, on, on patrol for a long time. They just know, they, they just understand that that's not often necessary. Well, I mean, it's hard to blame him, but I, I wouldn't know what to do. I would, I would be totally helpless out there. So, I mean, you know. Well, you get training, yeah, they, right? They, it's like, <laughs> they teach you. Yeah. Um, they give you lessons. But um, we, we looked at, we said, if, if pointing a gun at a cop is, or, or somebody else is a, bad, is a bad idea, really what we're looking at is people who, um, people who were, were really unarmed and didn't appear to be armed. And by, by appear to be armed, I mean... You know, if you had a if you had one of those um, airsoft guns that looked like a real gun, I'm sorry. You know, in a split second situation, it, it, that that really is just as good as having a gun. The, the law actually says straight up, it's it's about what the reasonable person would have perceived at the time, not not in hindsight. It's it's what you see. If somebody reaches into their waistband and takes out something that looks a lot like a gun, and they point it at you, and it turns out it was plastic. I'm sorry, that was that was a completely legitimate reaction, and any reasonable person would have thought that. But like. If it wasn't, if they didn't have a gun, I'm not suggesting that unarmed people are not dangerous. In fact, unarmed people are very dangerous sometimes. But what I am saying is, is that if you're looking for use for, for abusive use of force, for illegal use of force, you want to start where there was just no reason to use deadly force at all. And that's with unarmed people that, you know, on its face, that should be the candidate group that you look at. And that's what we did. So out of the, uh, I think, 1,500 people who had died after a police encounter in, in 2015, we looked at 153 cases of unarmed people who had been, uh, who had died after, or, uh, after an encounter. And we asked, I mean, I can't ask you because I've done this, but I've, I've, we've done this privately. But like I, I asked a lot of people who weren't police what percentage of that 153 they thought was going to be unjustified. And most people who were not in law enforcement guessed somewhere above 25 percent to about 50 percent, you know, thinking half. The, oh, unarmed person died. Yeah, there must have been a bad, a bad use of force. And if I asked cops, they would say one percent, two percent. Nobody went. Nobody went up higher. When we did all the research on the book and we found it and we looked at those 153, the actual number came out to be about 7%. And I won't go through the whole thing of how we got there, but it's a good number. And well, I, I, I read a little bit about I didn't read the book, but I read a little bit about how you, how you tried to analyze it. It was, it was not just you. It was, it was two other people as well. Yep. And you, you all sort of maybe disagreed a little bit about some of the more you know, marginal cases and, you know, you had some reservations, somebody else had some reservations about something, but it, at the most, out of the 150 people, 153 people or something like that, uh, at the, you know, mar margins of, you know, consideration for, for you three guys anyway, it was about 25 people, something like that. Something like or this. Some, something like that. And, you know... Uh, yeah. And yeah, it was it was uh, Ben Singleton and Ed Flossie, and both of them are highly accomplished individuals. Ed is a 
certified use of force expert. He testifies in federal trials and state trials in California. He, he worked for the San Jose Police Department for a long time as a use of force expert. Ben Singleton was a, a detective for, for 15 years. Um, yeah, and, we, and, and but but this whole thing of like cops guessing 2% and, and non-cops guessing 50% uh, unjustified tells us that nobody's actually looking at the data. Everybody's being driven by the dogma. Everybody's being driven by the talking points. So we, we started looking. One of the things that we decided was, in, you know, since there was unprecedented uh, attention being paid to these killings in 2015, and it was all over the news every single day, you would think that if you that if you were a cop, you would chill, right? Oh my God, if I if I shoot somebody or if I if I kill somebody, you know, everybody's going to know, and I'm going to be in the newspaper. And you would think that there would be some sort of a chilling effect on the use of deadly force by cops. And there wasn't, like not even a little, fifteen hundred, every single year. Yeah. Still to yeah, this day. Yeah, it's, it's scary. I, and it, another one of your findings is that. The majority of the of the incidents that you you know oh, the hundred and fifty three incidents happened at it it wasn't like police initiated contact they were responding to a call yeah right? I mean, they're not yeah they're not going out there looking to shoot somebody yeah there were there were a lot of a lot of things that we did to try to understand what was going on like so first of all how did the it's not just enough to say you know the, the, somebody died after a police encounter well how did the cop get there did the cop stop this person was it a traffic stop. Um, what, or, or was this a call from the community saying, Hey, you know, person X is doing something wrong and I don't like it. Come and help. Um, and in those cases, when that happened, when it was a 911 call, did they describe the person that was ultimately in, engaged with by the police? And if they did, was the description accurate? Were there any misidentifications when the police got there? Had that person already hurt anyone? Had that person killed anyone? When the police got there, did that person attack the police? Or did the police make contact and then the person fought back? Did the person fight back? Um, you know, what, like, what, what are the circumstances? Is that person known to have mental illness? And if, if, if we know that they have mental illness, what's the level that we know? Is it just that the neighbors say he's thrown off or is it that he's actually got a diagnosis of mental illness? And if he has a diagnosis, does he have a prescription for psych psychiatric medication? And, and if he has that, was he on his psychiatric medication? Was he inebriated? Right. What, Cause a lot of times cops and I, I've got a certification in, in mental health peace officer in Texas. Right. And, and I can't often quickly tell the difference between somebody who's mentally ill and somebody who's intoxicated. Um, you know, was the person intoxicated? Was, was it drugs? Was it alcohol? Are they mentally ill? Is it all these things? So, so these are the questions that we were asking and the way that we approached this was, um, public information, uh, public statements and public records. And we would make FOIL requests for the autopsy report as often as we could. And, we only got about half of those. If there was video, we watched it. There was only video in about 25% of the cases um, that, that year, because this was before the, the body camera, uh, you know, revolution. Um, but the, these, are the, these are the questions that we, that we tried to ask, because the number one thing that we were trying to figure out is, is there a bias in selection by police to go after people of color? And the answer is no, flatly no. The data shows it. These cops are not selecting people of color to do to, to mess with even the stops that were self-initiated stops by cops when they pulled them over. There was there was no um, disproportionate number of uh, people of color versus white people, male versus female. It's just not there. The question that we don't know the answer to and neither do you is when an officer shows up legitimately to something and they encounter a person of color, do they treat that person differently than they would uh, a person who is white? I don't know the answer. We don't have enough data and we still don't have enough data. This is what, six years, seven years later, and we still don't have enough data. Yeah. I, I mean, um, I was, I was going to bring this up later. Uh, well, let, let me say this first. I mean, I think the, the work that you did is super important because you know, you, I, I did some sort of back of the napkin calculations about like, you know, con number of contacts of police, uh, versus, you know, unjustified killings you know and it's it's in the same sort of ballpark as being struck by lightning more or less i mean it's, it's that's sort of where we're where we're at but th that being said people still die and people still are killed by cops yes. 
uh, and in unjustified situations. And the thing is, is that it, you know the, the the killings are tragic, but the fear that it that it that it puts on the community and on, on you know all these crazy you know sort of quote unquote journalists making these claims and everything um, really has some outsized impact. Yeah, it does. By the way, you, you just reminded me that I didn't tell you the number when we talked about fifteen hundred people died, and I said there's a widespread, and I wish it was better. It's forty to sixty million face to face interactions between police and civilians every year yeah yeah so yeah that I, I, lightning, I had it as i had it as 50 yeah okay and, <laughs> you know when you think about that that's just it's so extraordinary that that and this is something else a lot of times when when we're talking about police problems people will say things like you know they need training they need de-escalation training they need um cultural sensitivity training they need implicit bias training they need all these trains all right first of all um there, there's something I'm, I'm not suggesting that any of those trainings other than implicit bias training, which is just bullshit. Um, everybody's got implicit bias. Everybody does. Uh, but it, what I will say is um, <laughs> every single police encounter is a unique interpersonal interhuman contact dependent entirely on the attitudes brought that minute of that day by those people to that situation. The nicest cop in the world can be having a bad day. His dog died. His wife is cheating. His, you know, his son's not doing well. in school. there's all sorts of things that could go into this guy having a bad day. And it's the same for civilians. And so when people come together, there's going to be interhuman interpersonal thing. And you can train all you want and you're not going to change that. So people have to stop looking at training as this panacea. It's important to have the training. It's, it's important to do all these things, but it's not going to solve it. And I think that when I listen to people say this, um, I, I often am frustrated because they, they, they talk about it as if, if only these cops had that training, everything would have been fine. And I don't, I don't agree with that. Well, we, uh, we were talking a little bit before prep for this for this call, um, was sort of about public perception of police use force, and you said to me something which I which I thought on uh, uh, later, which seems seems to explain the situation pretty well. People really really hate being humiliated. Yeah, they hate being humiliated. Yeah, and and it seems to me that you could make a good case that really the most justifiable part of people's anger towards cops is is interactions where they're humiliating the, the kill the killings get get the get the tv shows and the you know all the headlines and stuff like that but but really at the heart of it is this feeling that i'm being disrespected uh, yeah that's it and that's what it comes down to and this is why i believe that people are looking people are looking to the killings as a proxy for their feeling that they are being disrespected by those who are supposed to protect them. And, you know, I, I have all the sympathy in the world that they're looking for that, but with, with respect, they're looking in exactly the wrong place. Every cop knows from the time they're in the police Academy that when you use deadly force, you will be investigated. And uh, since 2015, your life might be over and your professional life might be over your, you, you, you will be, there will be a 1983 civil suit against you. You will probably go to prison for any number of reasons. Cops are afraid at this point to, to use deadly force, right? This is, and those numbers being 1500 static every single year, it tells me one thing. Those are the 1500 that mostly were justified. And those are the 15. Remember I said in the beginning, right there, there are people who do terrible things. There are people who use deadly force. There are murderers out there. Murder is illegal, but people still do it all the time. People are, uh, th th there are very violent people out there and those people come into contact with law enforcement. And when they do, it often turns into a deadly force situation. Since we're not seeing the numbers change, I believe that that's about what the number is. And, yeah. and that's what, what it's always going to be. There's not much we do. About it. Right. You know, so if so, so now what, 
what we're really looking for, I believe, and, and I've spoken with colleagues over the years, and I, I think that most of us agree, but I'll just say this. We should be looking at non, use of non-deadly force. We should be looking at humiliation. We should be looking at um, rudeness uh, when, it, when it escalates past a certain point. I don't mean that, that cops have to be polite and, you know, mismanners. But I, I do think that the use of um, physical intimidation and aggressive physical behavior, the grab, the shove, the slap, the, the punching, the pulling your pants down and doing a dicky check, the making you sit on the curb while everybody is watching or making you stand around in handcuffs behind your car as the, as they're running warrants and getting ready to, to search your car. All these things are deeply, deeply humiliating and they are unnecessary and they make people angry because frankly, often the cops who are doing this are, even if they're not trying to, they're being assholes and the, the is, level is there, is there, yeah. Is there any evidence, like, does does the Roland Fryer stuff go into, is, is there any sort of, you know, pointers that that black people are, are treated more harshly uh, in those situations than, than, than other folks are? This is, this is a really terrible thing to, to ask because it's, it, the data are so bad. And so I can tell you, like I, I told you, I've already given you the answer to that question, right? Yeah, you um, have. Are the police selecting by ba- by race? Nope, they're not. I know, I, well, at least for deadly force encounters. Um, do they treat them differently? I don't know. And, and that's because we don't collect data as a society, as a law enforcement agency, as, as, as government. We don't collect the data on those things that I just mentioned as being the worst offenders. And so we can't tell you the answer to that. But I, you know, everybody, I think everybody feels, um, that there is some, you know, and is there a justification when the cops say this? It's like, you know, during the, during the, the de-policing, uh, brouhaha early in COVID, um, there was a lot of stuff about de-policing. And if you took a look at, at, um, at surveys at, at, you know, legitimately conducted surveys of people who live in poor inner city neighborhoods, those people were saying, no, we don't want the police to go away. We want we want these police people who lived there and had to live with the problems that they live with. They really do want the police. They wish that the police weren't assholes. They, and, and I believe that most of the time they're not assholes, but they don't want them to go away. They would like them to be more polite, more respectful, more community engaged. Everybody would like that. Right. But those are the statistics specifically that we are not gathering. It drives me crazy. <laughs> well, m- my opinion anyway is that like everybody's an asshole for at least 15 minutes a day. I mean, everybody, everybody's. A, right. So, but, but if you have a gun and a taser yeah. and OC spray yeah. and a stick, it's a bad 15, 15 minutes. minutes. <laughs> That's a terrible 15 minutes. <laughs> and I'm not sa- I, and I, again, I'm not, I'm not saying that, that often that those tools are being used, but listen, like, when, when I, I mentioned that they used to call it the, the use of force continuum, right? The, the bottom level of the use of force continuum was professional presence. And there really is something like if I show up and, and you know, I'm in uniform and I'm on patrol and I show up because somebody called nine one one. Um, and I, and I walk up. So here's this guy walking up, you know, wearing body armor and have, and, and I have multiple weapons and a radio that's blaring. So, you know, I've got friends with me. And I'm standing there. Now, the way I stand there with professional presence can imply a this this can be threatening in and of itself. So that's why it's the bottom of the use of force continuum, right? I am standing there and the potential for me to be violent is in fact a level of use of force. Now, let's say that I'm one of those guys who just happens to, you know, rest his right arm on the uh, on the butt of my gun. Is that intimidating to some people? Yeah, it's really intimidating. Do I mean it that way? No, but, but is it sure? So like that, that it's not, I'm not suggesting that the cops are using all those tools like inappropriately or too often, but I am saying I can understand why a member of the public would think that that's already threatening. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, you know, I, I, I've had very few interactions with law enforcement, but, you know, I, I have a few tricks that I use, you know, I, I've only been in, you know, let's say in my entire life, maybe 20 interactions with, with cops and I'm, I'm old. So you're uh, an old white guy and you drive a lot. I'm an old white guy. Yeah. I'm an old white guy. Yeah. And, but, but you know, what, what I always try to keep my hands in sight and I'm always polite and I'm trying to put them at ease. I'd make some jokes. I ask them, you know, how they became a cop, how long they've been on shift that day. And you might think it's like kind of ingratiating, which it, which it is, but, but it actually it's really, it really greases the wheels. You know what I mean? I mean, it really, really does. Yeah. To, but to then there's, be, I mean, I've got friends I, 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 who don't recognize that. it. That's yeah. So like, I, you know, here's what I recommend for everybody. And, and, and I, because I, I don't think, um, Look, so trying to social engineer your way out of a ticket is one thing, right? Um, what, what, we're, what we're all trying to do is is get through to to you and my my chief Jerry Venom used to say this all the time. Um, you know, when you pull somebody over, it's the tenth time you've done it that day. When they get pulled over, it's the first time that they've been pulled over in months, and it's a, it's a very it's a very traumatic experience, or it's a very threatening experience for them. So, um, we we should not treat it like it's like it's so routine. Um, there's a, there's a couple of things when I am pulled over personally. Um, what I do is uh, the first thing I do is that when they, when they turn on the lights and especially if it's at night, when they turn on the lights, I turn on my flasher to indicate that I saw their lights and I turn on the dome light inside my car so that they can start to see inside my car. And then often I will point like, because a lot of times if I get pulled over, it's on a highway or something like that. So I will point up like at a sign saying, you know, exit in a quarter mile. Or something. I want them to know I'm not blowing them off, but I'm also not going to stop when it's not safe. I'm not just going to pull over because they're there. Um, and so now I've now I've indicated to them that I'm responsive and I've turned on the light, which is really for their safety. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop when I stop. I'm going to do it someplace that is I consider my safety and I sort of consider theirs. But here's what I mean by that. There are there are incidents every year where you pull over on the highway and you force the cop to sort of be stuck out into traffic. And then the cop gets hit from behind by a drunk driver sending the cop car into my car, which I'm against. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I, I think finding a place where we can both pull off the road onto a hard shoulder or even onto a grass. That's what I look for. And so I will do that. When that happens, I roll down the windows and I don't care how cold it is. I roll down the front and back windows. My back windows are tinted. When I was a cop doing travel, doing traffic stops, I was always like, how many people are in this car? You know, it's hard to see. I roll down those windows. I take out my license and my proof of insurance or my license and my registration, depending on what state I'm in. Um, And I put the car in park so that it's not like they see my foot is on the brake and I'm not in park. I put the car in park. I then hold my license and my paperwork because look, I know I'm going to go for it anyway. I might as well get it out before the guy's here. And I put that between my fingers. I put my hands, the heels of my hands at the top of the steering wheel in plain sight with my fingers spread. I always worry. I always worry that if, if I take out my, I mean, usually I just have it at hand anyway. It's not, it's not much of a big deal to get out, but I'm always, I always worry that if I'm fucking around my go, my glove compartment around the seat or something that, that that's that could be seen as a problem as well. So that's the thing. Like what you what you're trying not to do uh, for anybody is you're trying not to make sudden movements and you're trying not to lunge for things. Um, so especially in states like Texas, where it's you know it is legal to have a gun in your car. Um, you, you don't you don't want to be diving into the glove box. And so you know here's what happens: you pull over, you stop and you've got the windows down, now's the time to reach into your wallet and take out that stuff, put your wallet away or put your wallet on the, you know, in the center console or something and get your hands up there because now it's not about you looking for your wallet or he could have even seen you because you got your your dome light on. But what he sees when he approaches is the windows are open. He can see into the car. He can see all the people in the car and he can see that my hands are up and empty except for my documents. Now we can have a conversation because I've just allayed his nervousness. Yeah. I don't want him to but, shoot me. I really don't want to get shot on a car stop. <laughs> no, it's not fun. I've never been shot. I wouldn't yeah. know. But, uh, but, but you you sort of seemed a little bit. I know you you're you're, um, uh, you, you have a bit of a civil libertarian streak. Oh, theme. absolutely. And 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 um, what I've 
sort of heard you say, maybe maybe I'm implying it with, without without reason, but uh, you know, I, I I said that I joke around with cops and I'm trying to get out of ticket, all that stuff. But uh, you said some people don't want to do that. Yeah. And, and are are you saying that that the people who don't want to do that 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 shouldn't be a requirement? You sh- you shouldn't. Is that what you're? Yeah, I'm saying that I shouldn't have to ingratiate uh-huh. myself to this flatfoot who just pulled me over and broke. You know, <laughs> I'm like driving someplace and he pulls me over and maybe I was speeding, maybe I was doing something, but you know what? I I. I I don't have to be happy about this. What I have to do is I have to be safe. I have to be I have to be law abiding, and I have to, and and I and I should be polite. It's it, it is to my best interest to be polite and make this thing go as fast as I can, um, by demonstrating what I, my concern for, his nervousness or her nervousness at the situation, like by by rolling down the windows, turning on the dome lights, showing them the empty hands. I, I believe that what I'm doing is demonstrating sufficient, um, uh, regard for our safety that that will be appreciated. And that's about as far as I think I need to go. I don't think that I should start, you know, being happy that I got pulled over. Um, and, and so, and I think everybody's on a different spectrum, right? I just, I don't want to imply that in order to get, in order to be safe in a traffic stop, you have to kiss some ass. I, I'm just saying what you, what is in everybody's best interest is reducing tension. It is a very, I will tell you as somebody who've done, I think I've done like 800 solo car stops. It is a very nerve wracking experience at night of a strange car. You don't know, you don't know how many people are in there. You don't know what's going on. They haven't put it into park. The windows are closed. Their foot's on the brake. It looks like they're ready to go. I, I don't know what's going on with this car and I'm walking up to them completely alone that that's to me that's a very nervous that that's a very nerve-wracking nerve wracking for anybody yeah uh so in waller county texas 2015 a black woman named sandra bland was pulled over and subsequently she got into a scuffle with the guy who pulled her over who was i don't think there's any question that the guy was just a total dick i mean yeah, I wouldn't even call. I wouldn't even say that plan. she got into a scuffle. I would say that he was just he was just he, an asshole. Yeah, and so the way it, the way it happens is that reportedly, anyway, this is Wikipedia telling me this, but he kind of pulls up behind her very quickly, as if he's trying to get by her, and she goes over the side, and he then pulls her over for failure to signal. I mean, some something like that, um, and. He had apparently done this before and whatever, just had a, a history of, of pulling over on people over on pretext, whatever. And this woman was um, a pretty outspoken, you know, Black Lives Matter activist. Not that that came up during this interaction at all, but it, but she wasn't shy about expressing opinions about what, she, what was happening and what she thought her civil rights were. And so she, he asks her, he says, can you stop, can you... Uh, Put out your cigarette. She was smoking, and she refuses, and it just it just spirals out of it. Stupidly spirals out of control. He pulls yeah. out his taser. Yeah, um, and she's screaming, and crying, and uh, and he says, "I'm going to light you up." He throws her on the ground. Whatever. Anyway, uh, there's no deadly force in that incident, but but it uh, he he uh, hauled her into jail. Uh, the official charge was something like assault of a police officer because she had kicked him. Right? And uh, she was in jail for two or three days and she was reportedly very emotional and, you know, the, just very fragile or whatever. And uh, somebody came by in the morning. She was fine. They came by a little bit later and she was, she was hanging by some sort of a makeshift noose uh, and she had, you know, her death was, was found by the coroner to be a result of suicide. And, and she had mentioned to folks before she, that, that she was depressed. That's the important uh, I thing. She told the jailers yeah. on, on admission that she, that she was depressed. on admission. Yeah. Really? Okay. Uh, it didn't, I, I again, this is Wikipedia. You never trust anything, but, uh, it just said that she had told her, she said it on Facebook or something like that. So yeah. Okay. Gotcha. So she didn't, I don't think other than, other than that, she didn't have any slam dunk signs of being significantly mentally ill. 
you know what I mean? But certainly she was upset, and she was she was distraught at, at this point. So anyway, her her family was surprised that she had killed herself, and some advocates expressed doubts about the coroner's findings. They think it was maybe she was killed, whatever. Doesn't none of that turned out to be true? But uh, the family brought a brought a suit against the county, I guess, for failing to protect her while she was in there from herself. And they won. It was a civil case. So. Well, did they win or was it settled? I, I and I'm not asking this. Uh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. It, it, it might have been settled. And, but, I, and I'm not suggesting they, that. I'm not suggesting that a settlement um, is a bad thing. I'm just suggesting that you know, there, there is a difference, and often, often settlements will, settlements will be sort of held up by, by, um, anti-police people as, as sort of proof that something happened, and oftentimes it's really they just want to pay it to get, to get rid of it because it's more expensive yeah, to, that's to a, actually that's, a, trial. that's an important point yeah important but point. i mean look and and by the way I, i'd like to call out the the officer brian insinia for being an ass uh, of of deadly proportions i mean he was just he was and and i will go back to the earlier statement like i don't know why she was in jail for three days you know she told him on in, on on intake i believe that that she had contemplated or, or even attempted suicide earlier uh, and she wasn't taken for mental health observation. But what? why was she in jail? And I think that she was did, in jail. Did she have away- warrants? Sorry? Did she have warrants? I don't know if she had warrants, but it might have been that she didn't have the money to pay the fine and, and that they wouldn't release uh-huh. her on her own recognizance. I, I don't know the answer, but but I, I, I don't think that this was an appropriate reason to keep somebody in jail for three days. Um, that, that officer, I, I had the... <laughs> actually the the pleasure of of going to a mental health course with a bunch of uh texas state troopers and and they played this this was that year and they were just groaning they were so unhappy watching this and they brought up a lot of things that i had not heard actually brought up in the public like he was also just breaking just to begin with he was breaking their own internal uh step there's a there's a step program in texas on how you do a traffic stop and he was breaking all of their internal policies on how he does traffic stop. like every single thing was wrong unprofessional stupid and he was an asshole um if you haven't listened to the the if you haven't listened to or viewed the this body cam video you should and you should hear it and you should hear um you know i happen to agree with her you know she's like all this is for failure to signal yeah um but again I mean, usually you, usually i find those things unwatchable because they're so upsetting but i have i have watched that one it's, i mean it's, a, it's it, an important it's thing to watch and, and mm-hmm. you know, I but I really do want to make it clear. This was not a death after a police. This was not a death after a police contact. She she lived and she was in she was in jail. No matter what happened in jail, it was three days after the traffic stop. So that that's why. And, and I'm not making a distinction other than I wouldn't have looked at this because of the fact that it was not a police involved death. It was something else. Um, but I will tell you that the Sandra Bland Act in Texas is a very powerful thing. Um, and it requires that if there is evidence of um, mental illness, if the person says that they are depressed, if the person says that they have a mental health diagnosis, if they say that they have considered suicide, then they are required by state law to be given mental mental health treatment. Um, you mentioned Tarrant County. Uh, Sheriff Weyburn actually has uh, one of the country's largest mental health facilities is, is in his jail. Um, and, you know, he has... I think it's 25 percent of their of their daily population of prisoners in their jail is has a mental health diagnosis and they're given meds and they're they're, they're given supervision. Um, so it, it's it's important to realize that the the positive aspects of of the investigation into into Sandra Bland's really horrible, tragic death and unnecessary death w- really have, I think, raised. They they. They shone a light on something that was important. Every single Texas police officer has to have 40 hours of mental health awareness training. Um, that that's new. That was part of that, um, and and had not been done before. And I think that I think that that saves lives, uh, and it, and it gave birth to a lot of uh, awareness. And as I said earlier, Texas does take you know one stop too too many on the crazy train often, but that's really a good law, and I think it's it's one of the most powerful in the country where they, they really did something to try to make a difference because of this. Uh, the, the divert to wear podcast you made, um, one of the people that you profile in the, in the, in the podcast is, uh, one of your friends named Colt Remington. Yeah. And, and he, I think you described as a, as an ex mental health peace officer. Well, he had, he like had that. just, 
he had just retired from law enforcement um, when I did that interview. Um, we, he was a he was actually a, a Marine Corps sergeant, uh, infantry infantry sergeant, and um, he went to the police academy with me, and uh, he was he was um, he was disappointed with with a lot of a lot of things that he saw in law enforcement. He 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 really did want to make a big difference and, and he felt, uh, constrained in, in the job. And, and, and yeah, in, in that divert to wear podcast, he, he tells the story of, um, a time that he didn't use deadly force. Um, it was, a, it was a, a man who was threatening suicide. And this is one of those, I always find it amazing that cops will come, you know, cause we're supposed to stop you. And, and just by the way, consider this, like, um, about 52% of, people who died in my, uh, panel of 153 people, um, 52% were suffering from a, a combination of mental health, you know, some kind of a mental health pr- a problem or drugs or alcohol or physical disability or a combination of those things. That's a, that's a really big number. And, and it sort of says that and if you read, if you read the book, or if you take a look at, at some of these things, what you'll, what you'll find is that over and over again, these, these situations were, were brought on by, uh, somebody in some kind of a crisis, uh, attacking or being strange and scaring people and then fighting officers. And if we could just do something about those, that's half of all the people who died, all the unarmed people who died that year. That's a lot of lives that we could save, um, the, the way American law enforcement tends to deal with this is something called the, the Memphis model, which is um, crisis intervention. And I've, I've always found that to be really stupid because you need to have a crisis to start it. And I'd like to do it. I'd like to, to try to get in before the crisis starts. Um, but, you know, after the, after the shootings in Dallas, um, when, when, when somebody, there, there was a black lives matter rally in Dallas and um, a U S combat veteran, uh, went with a rifle and started shooting at cops and he, he killed a number of cops during that. And, um, the, the, the Dallas police chief was talking about this and he's like, you know, cops are being asked to do too much. It's like, Oh, the, you know, there's drug problems. You know, let's have the cops handle it. Oh, there's mental health issues. Let's give it to the cops. The, it's really come that the largest mental health facilities in the United States of America are Rikers Island and, you know, LA County jail and, uh, Cook County jail. Like we don't, do proactive mental health care in America. And that's killing people every year. So Colt Remington, um, let me, let, just, oh yeah, go ahead. just for context, I, uh, um, the, the, the person you're talking about in Dallas, his name is chief David Brown. And, uh, let me just read something sure. that he wrote, um, in the wake of, of the murders of, of, of his officers. Okay, course. we didn't plan this, by I the mean, way. I'm glad, you, I'm glad you have that. Uh, uh, he, says, he says this. So, so five, five officers were killed, seven were wounded, and two other civilians were, were wounded as well. So this is the, maybe the day after, a couple days after. He says, Friday morning after our brothers were assassinated for being white and for being officers, the word was sent out. More protests are expected, comma, and we must not interfere with them. And that is the way it should be. What an incredible response! Wait, that's the one that I that. wrote. That's the piece that, that, I, that did you write? That? I wrote that. That's a, that's my New York Times piece. Oh, okay. I thought it was. Oh, I, I, I thought it was him. No, that was me. Okay, but well, hey, that is an incredible response. But I agree with you. That's an incredible response. <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, I I think that people I think that people need to protest bad policing. I think that people need to to be able to protest. They, they, they need to protest, but they need to protest what's real. They need to protest the, the facts. That's why I got so depressed because I was giving them facts about the way they're being policed. That that's really, it is unfair. And there's, there's stuff you can sink your teeth into, but, um, yeah, but, but the, the thing about Colt Remington, he shows up and he's one of a number of officers and there's a guy with a gun to his head and they, they sat there and Colt was the number one. He was the, the what they call the contact officer. He's like, he's like talking to the guy the guy's got the gun to his head. Now, you know, this is like the classic um, scenario training that they give you in police academies and, and, and uh, continuing training, you know, because that the guy's got a gun to his head and, and you don't know anything about him. Right. But but the the 
the act of moving a gun that's pointed at my head to point it at your face is really quick. And so it's a very dangerous situation. And Colt, again, a combat veteran, um, he starts talking to the guy. And over the course of 20 minutes, he gets the guy to put the gun down. And Colt gets up and walks over and picks up the gun and handcuffs him and takes him in. And they, they actually do take him to, to get mental health observation. And Colt was disciplined by his superiors for not shooting the guy. Yeah, they asked him why he didn't shoot him. They were quite upset. They're like, that was a deadly situation. You should have shot him. He's like, how, how can you tell me I should have shot the guy? You know, like maybe, maybe, Hey, way to go, you know, not shooting somebody. Yeah. Yeah. And they're like, and, and the funny thing is I mentioned earlier that, that Supreme court ruling, um, Graham versus Connor about when you can use deadly force. It even tells you specifically, you can't use what you know now about what the situation was to determine what should have been done then. So here's a situation where the officer on the scene, a reasonable officer, one with combat veteran, he was a combat veteran. He had combat experience in his mind. This guy was not using deadly force. He just needed to be talked down. And here you have a supervisor second guessing that that's yeah. terrible. Sort of sounds like a reason to quit. Yep. Um, so, so you see, you seem to be an advocate for reform laws like, well, you like the Santa Bland Act and, but you also seem to be a real about realist about what to expect because, you know, have way many more homeless people than we used to. And, and the, first responders and all that um if you were a police captain in a, in, a, in a jurisdiction that has high homeless rates and maybe some poverty and stuff what would you focus on what do you think you might focus on first to, to um make there's a, better? There, and that that podcast ever to where was was really talking about exactly what i would think is the right thing to do and I, that it would be the first right, thing okay. that i would do um yep i would and, the, and and but just to be specific what, what you're talking about is you're talking about more proactive mental health. Yeah. Sort of beat the streets, go meet these people, you know, ask them if they need anything, you know, try to get them help. Yeah. I would, I would, um, I would yeah. get a civilian um, clinical psychologist or I would get, get somebody who's a social worker, somebody who's trained in this and I would put them with my officers. I would get my officers extra mental health training and I would have them go out and, look for non-compliant medicine, med medicine and treatment, non-compliant people and, uh, people who are at risk of, of, you know, getting off their meds. And I would just have them to just keep contact. Hey, how's it going? Do you need any help? Can we drive you to your appointment? Have you got your prescription filled? Do you need some help? We can, we can drive you to get your, to get your prescription filled. We can drive you to your appointments. We will take care of that. All of that stuff gets me in trouble with cops who think that, you know, oh, you want cops to be social workers. No, it's, this saves money and this saves lives. This is much cheaper and much safer than waiting until they do something wrong and then arresting them. Um, I think NAMI, the, the National Association of Mental Illness, is that what it's called? They, they're estimating that around 40% of the people in Americans' prisons and jails have, have like serious mental illness. That's insane. That is absolutely yeah. insane. Well, and, 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 Peter Peter Moskis was always always sort of made a point of of saying we need more street policing. I yeah. mean, just sort of beat beat cops and stuff like that. And it yeah. seems like that's just an extension to that. It really is. The, the and that was like when I was a kid and I was a kid growing up in Brooklyn. We had our beat cops. I knew our beat cops. They knew me. I would see them walking to school. Like they they knew me. They knew what was going on in the neighborhood. They knew. They, they knew the shop owners. They knew the people who were right and wrong. Now, I'm not suggesting that there were not any problems. I'm just suggesting that when when you are working day in and day out in a neighborhood and you get to know the people and you get to know uh, who's there and who like who belongs there and who doesn't belong there. This, there's this concept, you know, everybody, everybody in the world who's ever seen Starsky and Hutch knows about probable cause. There's a there's a, a more powerful thing called reasonable suspicion. And it's based on the totality of circumstances and what I know about this place that person over there doesn't look right and I have a reasonable suspicion to at least go and talk to them that's what a beat cop can do and meaningfully not in a way that is abusive right but just like hey 
I've never seen you before. And I've seen you now for the past two days and you're sitting here and you look like you, you know, you don't look like you've got a place to sleep. Is everything okay? Like just what's going on? Those are conversations that can't be had by a number of people. And usually with, with, if you're not doing neighborhood policing, you have to wait until that person actually does something wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I, I see how people get, um, you know, burn out on it, uh, on, on not being able to make much of a difference because, and yeah, we could talk about this forever. I, I, yeah. All this is super heavy. You know what I mean? Like, like <laughs> I don't even live it. I'm just talking about it. I'm getting depressed about it. But, uh, but I'm, 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 I think maybe we should, we should probably, I, I, I really appreciate this and I, 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 this is super interesting to me. Um, I think probably we should maybe do another podcast. I have a ton more questions to <laughs> sure. ask. Uh, H- happy to do about it. about cyber cyber security and cyber crime and your take on AI and facial recognition and all kinds of stuff like that. But we, we just we just we just can't. We've been at it for a while now. Yep, happy to happy to do it. Uh, yes, we've been talking a while. Yeah. Um. All right. Well, I uh, Nick's um, information will be in the description. Uh, of this video and uh, I really 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 appreciate it Nick I, I really appreciate the opportunity to come and talk to you